So um, next up, what I wanted to talk about was a little bit about how, if you're working in a DevOps um, model, how that might affect some of your architecture decisions um, when you think about I'll give these folks a few minutes to get in. When you think about support and monitoring and keeping, keeping your system up and running and being able to troubleshoot issues, how might that affect your choices when it comes to picking an architecture, picking a technology direction, um, picking a place to host it? So we'll talk about a few of these. Uh, so first off, runtime platform. And what I mean by this is the decision to go with a technology like JVM or a Java-based technology or a decision to go with uh, a JavaScript-based technology or a .NET technology or a Ruby technology. There's a, there's a lot of different choices. Um, and how, how does that affect uh, your, how does DevOps and being able to monitor and support your system affect that choice? Um, there's clearly no right answer here, and it all, a lot of it depends on what your current staffing looks like, what your personal experience looks like, and as a, as a technical leader, what you're willing to sort of stake the reputation of the business and, and, your, and your product on. But some questions that, that come to mind from my perspective um, uh, really come around the idea of how quickly will I be able to know what the problem is when, when, when things go wrong. So for example, um, one question is, you know, how, how, how are error conditions reported? And so um, I'll, just, I'll just come clean and say I'm a longtime Java guy, and I've been working in, with Java technologies almost since Java started. So I have a ton of familiarity with how things work, what things work well, what things don't work well, where the gotchas are. Um, and so when I think about, when I constructed this list of questions, it was based on the fact that uh, as an example, um, uh, I know that when a problem arises in Java, uh, I'm likely going to find a, be able to find a stack trace in a log somewhere. And that stack trace is going to give me typically the exact line where you know, the, the code blew up. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, just, that's just one, one example. Um, the, other, the other thing I mentioned was what, what experience does your, does your current staff have? How comfortable are they going to be with, with the platform? Additionally, if you're planning on growing, if you're, st if you're a small team, but you know, you know to, to get to where you want to be, you're going to have to double or triple in size. Um, how easy is it to find people that know the platform? Um, you know, I know that there, there are platforms today like JavaScript that are experiencing extreme growth. And people are very excited about the kinds of things you can do with, no, uh, with Node.js on the server. Um, the question would be, what does the local market look like for Node developers? What is the what, and if you're not and, and and if you're willing to have remote people, you know how how available are they uh, to work remotely on this? Uh, a big one that I think Java really benefits from uh, is third-party libraries. So there's there's uh, a lot of support for DevOps for monitoring um, for building services with with Java and and really bringing in that metrics collection side. Um, they probably exist for uh, other platforms as well. Uh, and then lastly, because we're going to be, the goal that we have is to iterate, to shorten that feedback loop, to get things uh, written and deployed as quickly as possible, testing has to be an integral part of everything we do. There's no such thing as writing application code without writing the corresponding unit and functional tests that go along with that, in my mind. You can't, be in a, you can't be in a fully realized DevOps model without having testing be a core part of your activities. So from my standpoint, this, is, uh, this has been another one uh, that has kept me uh, in, the, in the Java camp for the teams that I manage. Um, but I'm open to being proven wrong. I'm open to be, being shown, hey, there's this great new uh, JavaScript test library that lets you do all these great things, and that you know. So it's it's really not about kind of latching on to a technology. It's about having some grounding principles, and saying how does this technology measure up to that. Um, so uh, again, specifically to my experience with the JVM, uh, some of the answers to those questions are are, are listed here. Uh, 
for example, uh, J JVMs give you a lot of great statistics around heat management, around garbage collection, um, uh, and around monitoring uh, memory usage, et cetera. Um, the exceptions with stack traces, as I mentioned. Thread dumps are a hugely valuable uh, tool that you have with, with Java Virtual Machines, where you can you know, basically request a thread dump, get a full representation of all the objects that are currently in memory, and you can figure out, oh, if we're having a memory leak or we're having some issue you know, staying within our memory bounds, what are the likely suspects? So there's some, there's some great, great tooling there. Um, my experience, Java engineers, at least locally, are probably the easiest type of engineer to find. Um, they're, they're, ev they're everywhere, and, and it's, you can find great developers who have experience with Java. It's taught, taught at universities. It's, it's sort of a, become a very fundamental language from an educational standpoint. Um, we make use of a lot of frameworks from the Spring libraries, uh, Netflix, Facebook, uh, that, that help us with, with, uh, with DevOps and with monitoring our systems. And so um, those, all of those tools, some of those tools are some of the most powerful tools in our toolbox that we have in terms of knowing the system health and knowing how things are going on our, on our system. Uh, and lastly, for anyone uh, that takes, the, so the class I teach during the normal program is a web development class. And uh, one of the things I really focus on a lot is writing tests. And uh, if anyone uh, has never used the Spock framework and you're working in a Java-based team, um, go, go on Monday and, and download this and start using it. Um, I, I just, it's been one of my, it's one of my favorite uh, utilities and it makes me a much better tester um, of my code when I'm using Spock. It's, it's an amazing, amazing tool. Um, any thoughts on this, either from a standpoint of, um, do any of these ring true from, for people that are using Java? You know, anybody have, an, have a different vantage point, either from you know, .NET or, or, or JavaScript or any of the other options? Yeah. I'm curious how a library from Netflix helps you. OK, uh, I'll give you a specific example. We use a library called Hystrix, which is, uh, is anyone familiar with Hystrix or heard of Hystrix? So what Hystrix is is a, a um, uh, circuit breaker library. So a circuit breaker is a pattern that when you're consuming a back-end service, let's say my service relies on uh, Twitter. We're going we're gonna to show Twitter feed of you know, people buying Target stuff, whatever it is. Um, that's going to be HTTP calls. And so we're going to be continually calling this back-end service all the time. A circuit breaker is a, is a piece of infrastructure that watches the, the response codes and the response times from a back end and will look for certain conditions. And if that condition is met, it will, it will, it will say, this back end is struggling. I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it some relief. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to open the circuit and not, let, and not make all the calls that are being requested. That way, I can give it a chance to recover and also make my system more reliable. Because if I start seeing longer and longer response times and my requests start backing up, I'm likely to destabilize my system as well. So it's really a protective measure against um, high latencies or high error counts destabilizing you and destabilizing your partner system. So that's a, that's a library that comes from Netflix. And it's, an amazing, you know, it, it's a well-known pattern. A smart engineer could write, uh, could write a circuit breaker library. Um, but you know why not? Why not leverage the smart engineers at Netflix? Um, the other thing is because it's an open source library, there's been tooling and monitoring built around Hystrix that's really powerful. It can tell you, it can it can give you some really great visualizations about what your backend communications are with other systems, and there's some really cool. We'll sh I'll, I'll show some uh, show some dashboards and and some real live data flow uh, monitoring systems that you can produce with. With, just because you're using Hystrix to wrap your calls to back-end services. So that's one, that's one example. Anyone, anyone have any experiences uh, from you know, making decisions like this that would lead you down a path of either a JavaScript path or, or a .NET path? I always love the .NET perspective because that, that has, you know, there's just a totally different mindset for when you're thinking about, you know, Microsoft, although even Microsoft is moving more towards open source models as well. So, OK, so his, his point is that they've started moving away from JVM-based services to JavaScript. 
and that the advantage is that they've seen better performance. The disadvantage is it's not as mature in terms of reporting metrics and, and giving you information about what's going on. I think the, the, the big thing for me that, I, that I, I'm not opposed to JavaScript. In fact, I like JavaScript a lot, and I would like to try experimenting with, um, with JavaScript on, the, on services front. Um, the part that makes me, uh, that, that's hard for me to get my head around is just sort of the, when JavaScript encounters an error, the process just disappears. Like that's, that's one that where you, you, you know, I, and, I, and I'm sure that there are things, ways working around it, and, um, but it, it's, it, it's sort of hard to kind of get my head around the, and I, I would, so, so the, his comment was that there's a lot of, there's some experimental stuff that's bringing some of those concepts like a thread dump to the, to the node world. Um, I would say overall what I've seen with, with the JavaScript landscape is that it's extremely active, it's extremely fast moving. There's a lot of develop, new developments coming out there, which is exciting, but it's harder to feel grounded that, you know, hey, what should we use for logging? Well, in Java, you've got these very well-established patterns, these libraries like Log4j that have been around for ages. And you know, uh, you know, it's fun to have choices. Sometimes having too many choices can you know, not be a great thing. And that's my initial reaction to, you know, every time I wade into the JavaScript landscape, I always feel like, wow, like, oh yeah, that's an old library. That came out last month. You know, there, it, it, there's just this, there's very rapid pace of, of evolution. And it's exciting because I think there's a lot of innovation happening there. Um, maybe I'm just turning into an old old man and I can't keep up. So, the, so what he said is the rapid pace of evolution there means that new versions are coming out all the time and sometimes you get breaking changes as the, if you don't pin a version, which is important, we'll talk a little bit about dependency management in a minute, but if you don't pin a version, you can run into trouble um, when, you're, when, you're, when it introduces incompatibility. Yeah. Absolutely, great point. So what he said was that they were primarily Microsoft. They've seen, it, they've seen that world move away from being exclusively Microsoft to playing well with other technologies and, and tools. And I, and I concur with your comment. I, I think VS Code is one of the best editors for, uh, for coding. I mean, it's, it's amazing. They, they've done a great job with that, with that product. And, um, and so they, they've, they've really moved, I think, uh, I was at Microsoft for about five years. And when Balmer uh, resigned, that was a big step in the right direction for Microsoft embracing non-Microsoft technologies. I think that they're, you know, they're doing some, they're, they're, they're heading in the right direction. Um, I, I think it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see where things like .NET goes from a services standpoint or how, how you know, I, I don't have a sense of how popular that is for a development platform, but certainly you don't have to just be on .NET to deploy into Azure. You know they're supporting, um, you know, and you don't have to even deploy onto Windows servers. So you know it's um, there's, they have to do that for survival in my mind, and they seem to be you know going in the right direction. So, Brian. Yeah, so yeah, yep. So more more endorsement of the hybrid model, and in fact saying you know uh, we we deployed a production or or staging environments we use JVM based services. But when we're deploying, lo when we're running locally in development, we use Node to serve that up. Um, so there's an well, interesting talk about kind of keeping that consistent across all your environments uh, in a minute. But it is, it can be fluid, and and um, you you can definitely combine a lot of these. You know, you don't have to be purely one stack. And I think that's a great point. The, the more consistency you have, the better for from a standpoint of developing expertise in that technology stack. But um, things really work well together. Uh, in the modern world with, with web standards. Um, so a little bit about um, some, some architectural abstractions and some pieces of architecture that, that are, from a platform perspective, are, are things that can make your system more flexible and, and help you with, uh, with you know, making things like uh, graceful deployments when you want to upgrade something and you don't want any downtime. What are, what are some things that you can do from an architectural standpoint, uh, from, a, from a DevOps platform standpoint? Um, you know, basic concept that is familiar to most people that, are, that have to deal with cloud deployments uh, is the notion of a load balancer. And this is just basically this idea that you know, the front door for your system will be a single entry point. And when a request comes into that entry point for a URL or for a web request, that will, that will come into that load balancer, and then that load balancer will figure out, okay, what's the appropriate thing in the back end to handle this call? Um, and what that lets you, well, there's, there's, and there's a couple of different notions here. The first is um, the concept of 
global traffic management. So um, if you think about, for, for people that haven't done things in the cloud before, every cloud provider will offer you the choice of what region you want to deploy your, your system into. And most of them have them in the west, in central, and east, overseas. Um, and so when a request comes in, something needs to decide where should I route this request to. And sometimes that's a matter of send it to the thing that's closest to where that request is coming from so that it can be fast. Sometimes you have a very simple round robin approach where you just alternate requests between two different regions. Um, but you, do, you, you typically need infrastructure that will help you determine which physical data center should that, that thing actually go to. Um, within, within the cloud environment or within the data center that you're, you're in, you probably or you may be likely to make other calls within that data center. And so there, there probably will be load balancers that will exist within the environment that you, that you go to. And what these enable you to do is to basically, well, they enable a lot of things, but a couple of things that come to mind uh, are they enable, you, they enable graceful deployment of new versions of software. So if I've got version A that's, that's out there running successfully, and let's say I've got three servers that are responding to version A of my software, and I want to put out version B, I can slowly start adding version B instances into my environment, and I can tell the load balancer, OK, load balancer, you now have a new instance of instance B up. And you can, you can slowly add them one at a time, and then, slow, and then at the same time, slowly start taking out a ver a version A uh, as you want to decommission those. So that's one example of what a load balancer buys you, is that graceful uh, upgrade from w one version to another version of your software. Um, it also enables things like auto scaling or, or being able to manually scale up. So let's say you're experiencing high traffic, high call volume, and you've noticed that your CPU has gone up from 25% to 75% on all your instances for a particular service. So somebody, somebody gets an alert saying, hey, um, our, our customer API is now at 75% CPU. You better get on this before it gets to 100% and we start seeing problems. Hop on. Uh, spin up five extra instances, and when the, as those instances come online, they just register themselves with the load balancer to say, hey, I'm a new instance of this back end. And all of a sudden, you should see those CPU um, utilization numbers go down in, in, the, in the happy path scenario. It doesn't always work that way, but that's, that's a very common um, solution for you know, a, a load-based a load uh, problem that might arise. Um, any, any other comments on load balancers? I mean, this is th these are these are just sort of a standard uh, sort of piece of infrastructure that I I can't imagine anything going into the cloud that isn't using, utilizing load balancers either from a global perspective or a, you know they're just it's like a for loop now for op, you know load balancers are like like an if statement for for ops people. Um, Another one that's extremely valuable, and we've seen, we've, you know, I've, I, it, we've done some, you know, in my mind, the engineers on my teams have done some amazing things with our, our key value stores. Um, the main example of one that I'll, there's, there's many of these, and you can, you can get, so think about configuring, uh, any configuration properties that your code might need uh, to operate in a normal state, whether it be database connections, whether it be backend services, you know, anything that allows it to communicate with other pieces of infrastructure. Um, getting those properties into your running systems is uh, an interesting problem, and there's some really well-known solutions to it. So um, one example would be something like uh, a utility called Console. Has any, you know, show of hands, who here's heard of Console or used Console? OK, not that many. Interesting. Um, console uh, is, uh, uh, I'm not a deep expert in it, but the way we've used console is it, it, it's a piece of infrastructure that serves as a registry of values, and you can, it's, you can, it can be hierarchical, so you can set many properties for um, a variety of systems with it. And the way, the way it can work is you can put a process on each of your service hosts that is sitting there calling back to the central console service to say, Send me the latest configuration for my particular type of application. And that will send it you know, the settings. And it's not just a static thing that it gets sent at runtime or at deploy time. It can be, you can go into the console admin screen and say, I want this timeout for this back end to go from 
half a second to two seconds because I know this thing's having trouble and we, we just need to do that right now. And that configuration change will get pushed out to every instance of that service that, that is configured by that property. And so it's a, it's a very, it's a very you know, powerful, you can do some amazing things with it and you, can, you, can, you don't have to, you can use it to, um, to deploy real time uh, configuration updates uh, you know, to a running system without having to restart or redeploy um, a lot of things. So it's uh, very, very valuable, very powerful um, uh, concept. Uh, the last one, is uh, the notion of a proxy. And these are, these are tools. Um, the, the one that I've got the most familiar, familiarity with is uh, a tool called Varnish. Um, anyone, just you know, show of hands, who here has used Varnish or heard of Varnish? Just, just a couple, OK. Um, there, there are others. Uh, but basically, um, for most services, what you've got to deal with is that you have an incoming request that is coming from a web application. Uh, an external system or uh, mobile application, and that request needs to get routed to some sort of backend thing that's actually going to handle that request. So, your proxy is going to be responsible for being configured when you when you're going to create a new endpoint, you're going to create a new service that that you're going to be offering. You want to configure your proxy to say when the re request comes in with this format, I want you to send it to this. Um, to this back end. And that back end could be a Java-based back end. It could be a Node-based back end. It could be um, you know, uh, w whatever technology it is. Um, but it gives you an abstraction layer between the inbound request URL and the thing that's actually responding to that. So it gives you kind of a registry of what are all the, what are all the paths, what are the URL paths that my system can understand, and where do those paths get routed to. Um, it also gives you the opportunity that it, it kind of that it creates an abstraction layer to say, um, if you need to alter the request in any way to provide additional information for your back end that didn't come from the original request, the proxy can actually append that to your request and and um, you know you you can you can change the nature of inbound calls into your services without asking your clients to have to go back and retrofit those changes. So. For example, let's say you have a bunch of old mobile apps that are still calling an old version of an API, and they're not including some parameter that you need to be required. You can use you can use a proxy like Varnish to say, hey, when a request comes in and it's missing this URL parameter or this header, let's introduce that. Let's introduce a default value so that my service can can respond properly. Um, we've used proxies like Varnish to um, create kind of a poor man's blue ma blue green deploy where um, we can tell Varnish that as we spin up a new, so uh, who, who here has heard of Blue Green Deploy? What, um, yeah, what, why don't you? We did an assignment, so I've heard of it, but I don't know. OK. <laughs> yeah, what, 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 what is, what's the general concept of Blue Green Deploy? Yeah, so it's a gradual ramp up of a new version uh, and then decommission of an old version of, of, a, of a service. And so um, pro proxies, because they create that abstraction layer between you and your callers, can give you the ability to say, okay, for, you know, I, I want you to send 10% of the traffic to this to the to this new uh, back end and 90% to the old one, and you can slowly ramp it up and just make sure that your response times are okay, your response codes are okay, that you know the world doesn't go on fire, um, and if you if you experience any problems as you do the ramp up, you can quickly switch back to 100% of whatever the old version was. Um, so we've we've used proxies for all these, and I'm a I'm a very firm believer in all three of these technologies as, as just essential parts of really creating a, uh, uh, a system that can be updated uh, easily and, and uh, you know, both from a runtime configuration standpoint and from a new version uh, standpoint. Is, is there a way to load balance across? Yeah, abs absolutely. You, you can use a load balancer to, serve, to, to do some of that proxy functionality. I think what, what we've, what, the reason that we've chosen to have a separate proxy layer is because of the high degree of configurability that we have. You know, one of the things is the load balancers are typically part of the cloud provider that you choose to use. And so they're, 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 it's infrastructure that's not in your control as much as we can put a Varnish server out there or an Apache traffic server out there, and we can have full control over that thing. Whereas if we, if we use functionality at I'm not going to mention any cloud providers exactly, but like a, a specific one, 
you're going to um, you're going to be forced to deal with the nuances of that particular vendors, and we can take Varnish with us if we want to have some things in this cloud provider and some in that cloud provider. Great. So, yeah, his, his comment is that 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 there's maturity and there's things happening like with F5, who is a F5 is a big time uh, load balancer provider. Um, they they are building out cloud agnostic uh, tooling, which is which is really important. Um, I think as we see you know, more prevalence of, you know, people want to, people don't want to have to commit to a cloud provider and be, and have to say, hey, we're making this big investment and we're stuck on this cloud provider indefinitely. So um, having those abstraction layers that, that um, let you be cloud agnostic are, are, are pretty important. Um, we talked about all this, uh, about configuration, but, but essentially, you know, console KV has, has been a, a great tool for us and we've, we've used it quite extensively. Um, you know, one example of how I've, you know, specific example of how I've seen this used in the past. Um, let's say you're, you're experiencing some really high traffic and one of the, one of the, you know, so we live in this world where you, we talked about the fact that there's sort of infinite scalability. You know, we, we, we sort of have gotten used to the fact that we can, we can ask for 10 more servers of an instance and get, get horizontal scale very quickly. Um, one, one place where this isn't necessarily true or where it's a little more challenging is depending on the kind of database you've chosen for your system, you may not have that option. You may be more locked into a model of saying, hey, this particular database doesn't really scale horizontally really gracefully. And so sometimes your only option is to really say like, let's get a bigger instance for that box. Let's get it more memory. Let's get it higher uh, bandwidth on its networking. And so um, we've had situations where we've, we've started to see the the infrastructure, the 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 the, uh, the network capacity get bogged down to hitting its thresholds on a particular database server, and in real time we've been able to spin up a database on a larger instance, um, get the data replicated over to that new instance, and then start switching the traffic from the smaller instance one smaller instance database to the newer to the larger one in real time, and um, this was all done because we were able to reconfigure that that backend database URL through something like console KV and not have to redeploy and, and not to have not have an outage of any kind. So um, really, really powerful uh, 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 things that are available to you. Another another example might be going back to um, the Netflix library, the Hystrix library I mentioned. Um, so that's that circuit breaker. And if you know if you know that one of your backends is really failing out and you don't want to wait for the circuit breaker to kind of give it a little bit of breathing room, you just want to say, you know what, that, that backend is in trouble. It's on fire right now. Let's just force, let's just force the circuit breaker open. Let's, 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 allow, let's not make any more calls to that thing so that we give them a chance to stand it up. And so um, we've, used, we've used console KV to just force a circuit open and allow and, and just prevent any calls from going. So it immediately fails and sends back the response. So your downstream systems have to be able to accept that, but you're really trying to protect your system and you want to give the, the back end system that you're talking to a chance to recover. So um, some examples of things that we've used for, uh, we've used console KV for. Um, all right, the next area, who here has heard of the 12 factor app? Concept of twelve-factor app. So, a couple of folks. Okay, um, this is one of these great. It's a little website uh, called uh, Twelve. If you go to twelvefactor.net, we'll we'll talk. I'm going to talk through the factors pretty quickly. There's nothing in the twelve factors that's earth-shattering, but that's what makes it so great. Is that is that it's a set of twelve principles that if you follow these principles, you will result. You will end up with a scalable system that um, is easy. You know that works in a DevOps model. And um, again, a lot of these things have become just sort of bread and butter. But um, it's great that, that somebody kind of collected these ideas, put them in one place. And it, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, a great, it's a great way to, to communicate successful patterns. Uh, the people that built Heroku um, put this together based on, you know, Heroku um, is a platform that's, it's an interesting cloud platform that really makes it easy to deploy uh, things into the cloud. And what I love about it is that it reuses metaphors like um, uh, pushing changes to Git, um, you know, which is what we, we normally do as we're making a code change. It's the same way you deploy code into production. So you actually push 
to Heroku, and then that deploys your code. So it's kind of it's kind of neat in that it reuses this concept of of Git as a deployment mechanism as well as a source code control mechanism. So anyway, the people that created the Heroku platform, uh, because they had a lot of applications deployed in their environment, they were able to see like, hey, which applications were more successful? Which applications had fewer downtime? Which applications were handling the most scale? And they collected these ideas um, and, and produced the 12-factor the 12, the 12 um, app concepts. Um, so we'll go through each of these uh, one by one. But again, the, if these feel like kind of duh obvious, um, that's, that's OK, because um, they are. Uh, so the first thing is a basic concept, which is you know one code base, revision control, many deploys. Um, the idea here is that you have one app per registry. So um, th there, I think there's been I think a lot of these are sort of going against anti patterns. Uh, so if you've never had this bad behavior or this bad habit, you're probably like, well, why do you need this rule? But but you know this industry is evolving, and it's you're always discovering things that. Um, you know, are painful, and then you learn from it, and somebody documents it. So, um, but the basic concept is you want to always deploy deploy the same code base to all environments. You don't want to have a version of your app that runs in prod, and a version of your app that runs in stage, and a version of your app that runs on your local development machine. Having consistency so that every you know every line of code runs in every environment is really important from a debugging standpoint, from a testing standpoint, from a performance standpoint. Um, the less, you know, if you can have no changes from, from your local development machine to production, you could, you could very easily reproduce anything, any problem that's happening locally, fix it quickly, and get it out. And so that's, that's really one of the goals. Um, you know, they talk about the fact that you can't, you know, one, one anti-pattern that I've seen places that, that that this, uh, this rule, this factor addresses is um, if, you're a, if you're a company that provides software as a service, but you install that software at various customers, and you have a different repository for each customer's flavor of that thing, um, you're not really following this, this practice. You should, you should really, you know, your app, if, if it's an app that, that you release, it should be in a single code base, and you shouldn't be trying to deploy multiple apps off of, off of that single code base. Um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't share code. Um, there are models for sharing code, and, and that's really more of the concept of a module or a library. Um, but from, an from a deployable unit standpoint, you should have each deployable unit should be in its own code base so that you can, so that you can you know, keep that managed centrally and deploy that from the, the code base perspective. So speaking of dependencies, another uh, important uh, uh, factor is that very few systems are built off of just the code that's written for that system. Um, most, anything of any size will, will depend on third party libraries, whether they be internal libraries for your company or whether they be open source libraries like the Hystrix one that I mentioned from Netflix. So as that's become a more important part of every system that, that we build, um, there are really good techniques for managing dependencies that your system has with other uh, with other systems with other modules. Uh, so, for here's a here's a list of examples where Java uses a build. Uh, there, there's a there's a very popular build platform for Java called Maven. Uh, Gradle also uses the same convention. Um, but they you you can declare your dependencies to say I'm going to depend on the Netflix Hystrix module. And um, somebody mentioned earlier that. As, as modules and libraries evolve, they get new versions. You probably want to specify exactly which version you're tied to so that you don't get, you don't get un, unexpected changes as that library uh, continues to evolve. So typically, you want to specify the module you're depending on plus the version that you're depending on. And that can be part of either your build process or your runtime process, which can go fetch those things at, at runtime. Um, because I'm more of a Java person, I'm more comfortable with defining it at build time so that when you create your artifact for deployment, it has all of the external libraries bundled together when you go to deploy it. Um, I think some of like, like the node, uh, I, I don't know, is anyone here familiar with how you deploy to a, 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 to a node environment? Is that, is that typically something that you would do there as well, where you would bundle it all as part of build time and then deploy it? Or would you, would you actually use NPM to 
to, to, to go fetch those dependencies at, at runtime. Any experiences with that? We do it the same way as with Java. Okay, so, so you do it at build time, okay. Um, does, has any, does anyone have any experience getting, getting external modules at runtime? It seems a little risky, but I suppose it's possible. Okay, so they built a model where they cached the dependencies locally and didn't, and explicitly said, okay, we now wanna go refresh our cache um, when, when, you know, do it on their schedule and not, not rely on just, you know, these, these, these repositories existing, yep. Um, so a couple strategies mentioned where you can lock your, lock your versions in your package manager or, um, or you, can prevent, you can prevent the servers from actually getting out to, to the NPM servers. So another strategy is to mirror the external dependencies onto a local uh, company-wide repository and then only up to update those versions when the new versions have been certified under certain conditions. So again, more work for you know, infra type operations to do, but, but some of those things can prevent some pretty big scale outages as was, as was mentioned that you know, a bad, bad version of a library getting introduced can, can bring down a lot of different things. Uh, so config, we've talked about this a little bit with, um, with console KV, but basically um, uh, a factor here is that you can, even though your code is the same in each environment, the properties for that code and the configuration for that environment is gonna be different. So, um, so you, you clearly never wanna put hard code URLs into your, into your source code. You don't, wanna, you don't wanna have the connection string for a database or the connection string for some service that you call on the web inside your code. That's, that's, a, that's a bad pattern. Um, so options could be that you, you know, really what you want to strive for is that that configuration comes from your environment. You can do it in a variety of ways. When you lay out your image and you, um, you put in your flags for your Java process, for example, your properties can come in through the command line. And that's one very common way of doing it is that you, you ask your command line uh, when you start up your Java process or you start up your node process to um, supply those properties at runtime. So when you bake an image that, um, or you, 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 and then, so at, at runtime, that, those properties can come from somewhere, either a file on the file system, or they could come from uh, a process that knows how to call back to um, a uh, uh, config store like console to get them. Um, and the deploy is responsible for saying, we're deploying to prod, we're deploying to stage. And so by, by, by naming where this deployment is happening, it will collect the properties that are associated with that environment. Uh, so how to deal with backing services is important. And again, this is sort of this notion that any, anything that's not part of your system, uh, but your system needs to deal with and interact with, um, it should be treated the same way. So for example, Databases, um, asynchronous messaging, email sending, caching, uh, other HTTP uh, um, backend services, all of these things should be configurable to your application through a URL. And that allows you to say, this is the dev version of this um, uh, backend, this is the stage version, this is the prod version. Um, Creating general abstractions is better than creating specific ways of accessing that resource that are specific to that type. So an example might be, uh, you know, when you're, when you're interacting with a database, um, using a general purpose uh, API for accessing data like JDBC or like Hibernate is preferable than using platform specific APIs that would tie you to a particular data store like you know, Oracle or, you know, whatever. So, so kind of thinking about building things out that are, give me access to this resource, here's the URL for it, I get back an interface that lets me access data back and forth to and from it, and that gives me the flexibility to change that URL to be from a MySQL connection string to um, a Postgres connection string, and as much as possible, we'd like that to just be a seamless transition to be able to, to migrate off of um, one resource to another. Uh, so three phases of how you get code from being in your repository to uh, a running system. Essentially build, 
takes the code, transforms it into something that can be executed somewhere. Release would be to combine that code with its configuration for that environment. And then running it is actually you know, what you'd expect, running, running that release. Um, when you do this, you should always tag a release with some identifier so that you know what's currently out in that particular environment. And that typically is a version number. Perhaps it would be a date. Um, but essentially, you, be, you want that release process to always be able to identify when was that thing created and what changes were in that release from the previous version. That's, that can be really important when things go wrong. If you're trying to troubleshoot a situation, the first thing you might want to do is go look at the change log between what did we have deployed this morning and what do we have deployed today? And could, could something in that change be causing the problem that we're having right now? Um, builds clearly can be initiated by uh, developers, but then also um, it's, it's critical or it can be very valuable to whenever a change gets committed into your source code repository to automatically, after the, after the tests pass, to deploy that into a, a development environment uh, and, have it, and have it out there so that your business users and, and testers can, can go and, and certify that as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. uh, so a little bit about how your running services should be designed so that they uh, have maximum scale. Uh, so a couple of concepts that are really powerful uh, number one is that, they sh that every service should be completely stateless. Every request that comes in should be handled in isolation. And you, shouldn't tr you should not keep around, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, this has been a, a pattern that's been around for a long time, sticky sessions within the Java, Java web world. Um, it's great. So a sticky session is think about a shopping cart on an e-commerce site. And every time you, you make a request from the server, you say, hey, add this item to my cart, or what's in my cart? And the, if the server creates some memory that is associated with that particular user's session, every time a user comes to your system, you're going to be creating a new, uh, a new memory footprint on your server that's going to slowly start to build the amount of memory that that, that server needs. Uh, so that's a, that's a bad pattern. What, what, this, what this factor is advocating for is to say, when a request comes in, we should handle that request and, and then forget about everything about handling that request when we, when we send the response back. So that every request that comes in, we're just dealing with that one thing um, versus, versus continuing to build up more and more uh, resource usage with each request. Um, but you, so clearly, you have to solve the problem of what do you do with that shopping cart? How do we handle? Um, how do we handle the, uh, the fact that somebody wants to preserve what they, what they added to their cart from request to request? Um, and one of the solutions for this is to um, create, to use another piece of infrastructure like a, like a key value store uh, or, or a memory-based database like Memcache or Redis, which lets you basically look up at runtime, uh, a fast lookup. Hey, tell me what the cart is for this user. And that, that doesn't get associated with the system handling the request. It's an external resource. So it's kind of a, an in-memory, a very fast in-memory database that lets you implement that type of logic. Um, port binding. So this is, the, uh, this is the idea that every service needs to listen um, to a port to have incoming requests. One of the things that's a big mind, so this might seem obvious, but one of the big mind shifts here is that with a 12-factor app, you're moving away from this idea that you're taking some code and you're deploying it into a larger infrastructure, like a, like a WebSphere or a Tomcat or some sort of application server that's handling the requests for you. A 12-factor a 12 app is responsible for, it's a, it's a small executable that when it spins up, one of the first things it does is it opens up a socket and listens on a particular port. And it, it's the thing that deals with handling the request itself. So you don't need any other infrastructure. You don't need any other uh, larger piece of software that is handling that networking layer for that application. It's a, it, the, the goal for this is to be able to run it on its own, to minimize dependencies, and to maximize um, startup speed. So if you're, if you're not relying on this big, uh, big server to start up and then your code runs within that server, you're going to likely come up faster and you're going to have less dependencies. Does this, does this make sense? Okay. 
Uh, concurrency, another factor. So um, think about breaking up your, your application into a series of processes that can be running concurrently and simultaneously. Um, so for example, if we've got, if our system has to deal with um, incoming HTTP requests, we also have a, a, a batch process that needs to run every 15 minutes that, that goes and reconciles something or, or brings in some external data. And we have, a third, we have a third concept that is dealing with asynchronous messages from another system that we need to be updated when other things happen. Use, actually use separate processes to do each of those things. That way, each of those processes can be scaled up or down independently. And so if you need more processes to, um, to receive inbound requests, you can spin that one up, but not, um, but not have to spin up your batch processing or your event processing. So just think, think about the different types of operations that your overall system needs to do, deal with and, and have each of them run as independent processes. Again, this comes back to this idea that probably 10 years ago, um, most applications were, were being run in a large web application server that was doing all of these things within one process. So you were kind of bundling together um, HTTP request processing with you know, something that ran on a cron basis. And, and so all that stuff kind of came together, kind of was deployed together and is running together at the same time. This is encouraging you to separate those out and run them as individual processes. Uh, disposability. So this is, this is enabling the um, fast startup and the graceful shutdown is enabling uh, things like um, graceful, graceful uh, or sorry, as you scale up. So as you request new uh, capacity from your system, you want that capacity to come up as quickly as possible so that it's available as quickly as possible. Um, on, the, on the other side, graceful shutdown allows you to stop listening for requests and let the current request finish processing before you decommission something. So thinking about both fast, fast ramp up and graceful shutdown will enable your application to deal well when you're spinning up new instances and tearing down old instances uh, continually. And you have to sort of expect that this is going to be a normal part of business operations is to spin up new ones a lot and tear down old ones a lot. In fact, you may not even be scaling up your own system when this happens if you're working in a in a container-based environment where you're kind of balancing load and you're putting things into different servers all the time, you might just be getting swapped in and out um, even if you're not scaling. So, um, so, so building your system with this in mind will make it flexible from a standpoint of it can be deployed in containers uh, or VMs equally and it, and it should behave properly in, in both. Um, talked about this a little bit. Let's keep keep all your environments um, as similar as possible. That helps really with troubleshooting. Um, that helps you um, get from local development to production as fast as possible. Um, it, does, it does require that you have efficient uh, CI, CD so that you can define what these environments look like and, and get things flowing from one, to, from one stage to the next as automated as possible. Um, and having tests is really critical here. Um, that's your first gate of security to know I just introduced something that's going to break something. You don't want it getting to the next phase without running those tests. Uh, you want that to ha stop as soon as possible so that the developer gets the feedback and can make the change before it gets any further. Two more, and then we'll take, a, take another break. Um, logs. Logs are really important for 12-factor apps. They're really important for DevOps. Um, so think about logs as... Uh, event streams for your application. They're a, they're a transcript of everything that's happened. And so you should think about the fact that um, it's really your way of kind of getting a time-ordered series of, of things that, that took place. Um, the 12-factor app tells you to write it to standard out um, because that's available on every system. And then depending on whether you're doing local development or it's deploying into a VM or a container, you can, you can take that output and either force it to a file or force it to something that can collect that log and take it to an aggregator like we mentioned Splunk or Elk for further processing. Uh, but basically logs are one of the biggest sources for creating dashboards. And so you want to take into account also that um, you know, with logs you are going to have to store that information somewhere. And so 
producing too much log noise is not only going to be expensive from a, you know, a storage perspective, it's going to be expensive from an analytics perspective to be able to sift through a bunch of stuff that's meaningless. So it may take you some time to develop a sense for um, how can you e efficiently uh, include information that's useful, but then also omit information that's really just polluting your system and creating uh, non-value added data in your, in your log storage. Um, but this can be, you know, th this, this can take a while for your team to develop, you know, a, a sort of pragmatic approach to logging. And you're, you're going to find times where you're like, well, we're logging way too much now. And it's okay. You you learn those things. You you make the change, and you get it deployed quickly, and you and you and you get more efficient at logging as time goes on. All right. Last factor, uh, admin processes. And so th this is the idea that um, you know you basically ha you're going to have to have administration and management of your system um, that helps you determine what's going on. Uh, and so basically. Um, create scripts, create programs that would run in the environments uh, that are as close as possible to where the systems are running to do things like database migrations, to give you some uh, REPL shells that will let you maybe run some real-time queries or apply some logic at runtime that can help you troubleshoot and diagnose situations. But these, these can be an important part of helping you troubleshoot and helping you do some routine maintenance um, on, on the running systems that are in environments that are closest to uh, being similar to, to where the systems are running themselves. Uh, there's the 12 factors. I, like I said, if you've never been there, take a look at that website. Um, it's just a, it's a handy uh, overview of, of a lot of great concepts, and a lot of them have just become standard operating procedures uh, for many teams uh, that are building scalable cloud-based applications. So uh, let's take another 10-minute break, and we'll, we'll start back up again. <laughs>